When John Bagley asked me to make a few closing remarks at the end of the session, I asked him what should I say, and he just said, be inspired, so I'll do my best if I can. But I know that I'm standing between you and all the bars and restaurants and uh, perhaps even the journey home for some of you, and that's never an easy task at the end of a very busy session. But I hope you've enjoyed the last two days as much as I have. I certainly think we've heard from some very distinguished speakers, experts in their field, but a very wide range of fundraising issues and about techniques and challenges. The presentations, in my experience, have all been interesting, informative, practical, and productive. And I think we can all make very good use of them. As I say, I was asked to try and be inspirational. I got that as a challenge, but I think that what many of us do as we've discussed things over the last two days is inspire each other to the good work in which we're involved. Albert Einstein, born of course here in Switzerland, said of Galileo, Newton and other scientists who came before him, I stand on the shoulders of giants. And I think so do we, because we follow in the footsteps of people who've raised large sums of money for very good causes. We all get our inspiration from different sources. I come, as I've told some of you in the last two days, from the city of Liverpool, where I grew up and some of my own inspiration comes from there. Liverpool is my football team and I grew up supporting them when they had a giant in football managing, management, a man called Bill Shankly. He was once asked whether or not he thought football was a matter of life and death, and if someone might just assist me with this, <laughs> or there we go, that'll do. I'll abandon the new technology. Bill Shankly was asked, was football a matter of life and death? And he said, no, it's much more important than that. Today, I'm going to suggest to you that my answer to the question, is philanthropy and fundraising simply a matter of money? I'm going to say no, it's about much more than just that. And I want to demonstrate that it's about more than just money by talking about some good causes, how they came about, and what difference they're making. The first example I'll talk about will be the Red Cross. Next year, the year 2013, the Red Cross will celebrate its 150th anniversary. But it was founded by a chance occurrence by a Swiss businessman, Henry Dunant. In 1859, he traveled to Northern Italy to obtain a business document. There, he happened to witness a one-day battle between Austrian and French armies outside the town, town of Solferino. He was horrified to see that 9,000 wounded soldiers were left without any medical attention and he organized local villages to help to care for the wounded. After returning home to Geneva, Denan could not forget what he had seen and he published his memoir of the event titled A Memory of Solferino. The book was a huge success and it influenced a Geneva charity society to join with him to form the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, which met for the first time in February 1863. Later that year, the committee held an international conference to bring together government and private aid organisations. The combination of public and private support became an essential element of the Red Cross. The 1863 conference led to 10 resolutions that outlined the goals and organisation of the ICRC. They wanted every country to form its own Red Cross committee to address their needs and to work in concert through the ICRC. The first Red Cross societies were created in Belgium, Prussia, Denmark, France, Italy, Spain and other European countries in 1863. The American Red Cross was founded by famous Civil War nurse Clara Barden in 1881. Almost every nation in the world has formed its own Red Cross or Red Crescent. Each national group supports the fundamental principles of the movement, which are humanity, impartiality, neutrality, independence, voluntary service, unity and universality. Their record is huge, it speaks for itself. I won't read through it all, but you can see from this slide how many people have been helped by the Red Cross since that chance event more than 100 years ago when a man saw 9,000 
wounded soldiers in need of help. I'll talk about another case, I think a very strong and very interesting case, that of Alcoholics Anonymous. Almost everyone will know someone in their community or their social circle or even their family who is affected by alcohol or other drug problems. Addiction is a growing problem which tears apart communities and families and blights lives. Alcoholics Anonymous and other similar fellowships have helped millions of people recover from their problem and by following a few simple principles and a program for sober living they've become productive members of society. The definition here which AA uses is that of a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength and hopes with each other to help them stay sober. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. AA was founded by people in Akron, Ohio in 1934. In 2012, it's estimated to have over 2 million members worldwide, with 114,000 AA meetings taking place each week. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous has sold over 30 million copies and is available in 58 languages. AI, I think, is a remarkable organisation in many ways, but I want to talk this afternoon just about three of them. Firstly, AA is fully self-supporting from its own members and it declines outside contributions. AA says that its primary purpose is to carry the message of recovery to the still suffering alcoholic. It does not endorse, finance or lend the AA name to any group, facility or outside interest lest problems of money, property and prestige divert them from their primary purpose. But money does matter. It's collected on a voluntary basis at every AA meeting. Each AA group keeps only what it needs for its immediate purpose let's say a prudent reserve, perhaps one month's rent of the building it's using for a weekly meeting. All other money is passed through a local, national and international service. The structure is bottom up with each part of the structure retaining only what it needs for its immediate functional operations. There's a relatively low maximum limit on the size of donation any individual member may make. A has even been to court to refuse bequests made to it to protect these traditions. This may of course seem quite extreme for many of us, but it works for them. And there is I think something inspiring about a group of people who when they were drinking were often the most unreliable spendthrifts. Often in debt, borrowing from friends and family with little hope of ever paying back what they borrowed. But now in sobriety refusing any outside contribution and from, the, from within their own resources running a worldwide recovery fellowship. Secondly, this refusal to accept outside money evolved almost accidentally and the impetus came through it from one of the richest banking families in the world. As AA began to grow from two members in Akron, Ohio in 1934 to then dozens and then across several US cities and then to hundreds of people, there was great excitement that a new and effective treatment for alcoholism had been discovered and the question was how best to spread the news. Many members, including one of the founders, William Griffiths Wilson, known as Bill W, he had grand plans for AA buildings and centres with paid staff and large budgets. An associate of the Rockefeller banking dynasty suggested AA ask his boss for funds to make this happen and they agreed. Rockefeller's associates warmly endorsed the proposal and it looked like AA was about to get a substantial financial donation to go nationwide on a grand scale. But then Mr Rockefeller himself had the vision to see that a sudden injection of cash might destroy the fledgling movement and to appreciate the value of self-support and one alcoholic aiming to help another. So he said no to the large donation and suggested instead covering some of the modest travelling expenses of the two founders 
and the initial cost of printing a book about the AA program and the personal stories of the first 100 people to get sober, which would be for sale to prospective AA members, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. As Bill W. later wrote, Mr. Rockefeller saved the AA from my ego, which would probably have destroyed it. Thirdly, a key component of the AA recovery program, and a key part of what keeps AA members sober, is helping others. When Bill W. first got sober, he had to try to help other alcoholics to do the same, and his first attempts were not particularly successful. He'd been a stockbroker in New York, but he'd fallen in hard times in the early 1930s. His wife, Lois, helped support his philanthropic work in the early months as he spoke to one alcoholic after another. They were all on Skid Row and in asylums and hospitals, but he told them what he had done, how he had given up alcohol, and he encouraged them to do the same. But although the speakers he spoke, the, the drinkers he spoke to, were very impressed by what he had done and were very keen to try, they kept on getting drunk. Six months later, with funds running low, Bill was exasperated and on the verge of giving up. He said to his wife that it was hopeless. He tried his best, but not a single person he had tried to help had stayed sober. He said he asked too much of her and he should now give up this work and get a city job to pay the bills. The whole of AA's future and the lives of millions of alcoholics stood on a knife edge at that moment. AA was saved not by an alcoholic but by the long-suffering wife when Lewis Wilson turned to Bill, took his hand and said, what do you mean not a single person has stayed sober? That's not true. You have. The effort to inspire others had inspired him. Now, I'm not going to say in all these issues that money is not important. Of course, it does matter greatly. What I am saying is the desire to give money is rarely the reason why people start philanthropic movements. And sometimes, the wrong amount of money, contributions that are either too large or too small, or spent on the wrong thing, can hinder rather than help social and humanitarian causes. Movements start because people see a problem. They feel moved, even compelled, to address those problems. They see a solution that they believe will work. They have a vision, perhaps a dream. They believe they and others can and will make a difference. They share their dream and they inspire others. One of the people who inspired me most in politics, a former leader of my party, a truly inspirational personality, Lord Paddy Ashdown, often used to quote in his speeches, T.E. Lawrence, more commonly known as Lawrence of Arabia. He said, all men dream, but not equally. Those who dream by night in the dusty recesses of their minds wake in the day to find that it was vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous men, for they may act their dreams with open eyes to make it possible. Money is not the dream, but it can help to make the dreams possible. One of my great political heroes is Robert Kennedy, assassinated in 1968, but in his presidential speeches of that campaign, he used to use a famous quote from George Bernard Shaw to end his presidential campaign speeches. He said, some men dream of things that are and ask why. I dream of things that have never been and ask why not. Much of my own experience has obviously come in fighting and winning elections, but I believe there is a much higher purpose to winning elections than simply winning. Principles about gaining power and influence in order to change society for the better. Sometimes I admit that can get forgotten in the day-to-day -day campaigning. And in the scramble to change hearts and minds and win votes, the bigger picture can sometimes be forgotten as people get wrapped up in the techniques and the minutiae of campaigning. And I believe that sometimes the same can be true of fundraising. 
often there were appeal targets and deadlines to meet, and the detail of that can take over your life. The bigger picture of why you're raising the money can sometimes be harder to stay focused on. Several times in modern history, my party's almost gone out of existence. Many people questioned how it stayed alive, and many people expected its demise. But principles, key principles, like civil liberties, internationalism, tolerance, social justice, and environmentalism were the core values that kept the party going. And these were the principles of the donors I helped to attract to make the party grow. The party general was outspent by its major rivals by a factor of 10 to 1. I helped in the work I was doing on fundraising first reduce that to a factor of about 4 to 1 and then to about 2 to 1. There was an old joke in my party that we were so unsuccessful our number of members of parliament could fit into the back of a London taxi. In fact, I think at our lowest point we had six members of parliament. But today we have 57. I helped the party get to over 60 MPs and at the last general election our party leader Nick Clegg joined the coalition government as Deputy Prime Minister. I obviously don't want to be party political in any way this afternoon, but for those of us involved, we are proud of the differences that we are making in government, things that we have achieved and things that we have prevented, and we feel we're fulfilling the hopes of those people who kept going in very hard times. But we know we were only able to do this because of the dedication, perseverance and vision of some supporters in difficult times and inspirational leaders who led us to better times. My own role was not just fundraising, although I was very successful at that. My main contribution probably to their electoral success was about spending the money that we had more wisely and targeting it more carefully. I want to give you an example of targeting, an example that comes from Africa, about a British doctor on secondment in East Africa with expensive equipment and highly trained, mostly foreign specialists, he was forced to confront in his mind how little he and his colleagues were able to do to make any significant impact on AIDS and malaria deaths. They could make death less painful, but they could not reduce its incidence. He tells the story in the book of a young woman called Sarah taking a year out from university working on a minimal budget, going from village to village, giving out condoms and mosquito nets. And he calculated that her work over nine months had a more positive impact than all the doctors in the hospital working over many years. She took a different approach. So sometimes I think we need more open-mindedness and more lateral thinking. Another example of this I would give it's from 25 years ago in Coventry, England. A group of midwives, nurses and childcare professionals. They want to develop an information pack for every new parent in the city. It would contain vital and useful information on parenting and support and resources available to parents and their children. Putting together the information was very easy. Giving out the pack would be easy too because all women giving birth in hospital went to one maternity hospital in that city. The problem was getting the money to produce the pack and keep it updated and in print. This of course was long before the internet. So someone suggested sponsorship and most people came up with the idea of approaching companies providing baby food, baby clothes, prams, buggies and so on. But none of these organisations were interested and if you think about it, it's not surprising because new parents have to come to this small group of well-known firms for their baby food, clothes and equipment, whether or not they sponsor the information pack. There wasn't much value in it for those sorts of companies. Then one day, a family member of one of the midwives was reading a newspaper article about the then housing boom and looking at when and why people moved house. He read, an interesting statistic that said that over 60% of families who had a baby moved home within 18 months of birth. He spoke to his wife 
and they came up with the idea of approaching a mortgage company, a building society, to sponsor the booklet. The response was immediate. A well-known building society covered all the costs in a five-year deal. They were desperate to get their name in front of a group, 60% of whom were pretty much guaranteed to be buying their product in the near future, and whom they had no effective way of identifying at that time. A different approach worked. Technology, as we've been discussing, may have changed many aspects of our lives, but some fundamental things have not changed. We have now many more tools and techniques to help us in our fundraising. We've heard a lot about them over the last two days. But just as it's possible to become distracted from the vision and values by the day-to-day -day pressures of targets, so it's possible, I think, to become distracted from the importance of a simple, clear, and effective fundraising message because we have shiny new toys at our disposal in which to communicate that message. A friend of mine recently drew my attention to a letter written in blue ink, copyright handwriting, in 1863, asking for money to help relieve the suffering caused by a cholera e epidemic in Limehouse, London. It was just over one page in length, and it showed the key characteristics of an excellent fundraising request. It set out in this letter the basic case for support over four questions. What is the problem? What needs to be done to make it better? What will it cost? What can you do? And you'll not be surprised to learn that this letter was very successful. And whatever the medium, the basic message of fundraising is that these principles don't change. Early in my work in politics, I learned a four-letter phrase and mantra from a mentor. The mantra AIDA, A-I-D-A, A stands for attention, I stands for interest or involvement, D for decision, and A for action. And I believe all successful campaigns need these elements. With these elements, everyone can make a difference and everyone has a contribution to make. Sometimes in fundraising, we're quite rightly focusing on the big donation. Indeed, my contribution to this event yesterday and today was to talk almost exclusively about raising funds from a small number of rich people. And of course, we can easily think that big is beautiful. In fundraising, we may think that those who make the most difference are perhaps Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, or the Clinton Global Foundation. Their philanthropic efforts are obviously important and impressive. But I think we must let others think that because they cannot do everything, then that there is nothing that they can do. When we see the scale of need and injustice in the world, it's possible to become paralyzed by the enormity of the task that faces us. But there is an ancient Chinese proverb I sometimes quote when people think about daunting and large tasks. The proverb says, any journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And when we get people to make a first contribution, they're often taking that vital first step. We can find people to help us and inspire others, and they'll often come from very different backgrounds. Two people I might cite for coming from very different backgrounds are Princess Diana and Mother Teresa of Calcutta. They both died a few days apart in 1997. Princess Diana was well known for her charitable work, and there is no doubt that her public handshake with AIDS patients at the London hospital helped to change bigoted attitudes to that disease. Mother Teresa lived a life of poverty and service, driven by her faith, and her order has spread worldwide. Details of the two, two women's wills were carried in the British press on the same day in 1997. Princess Diana had left some 15 million pounds. Mother Teresa had left two saris and a bucket. But both their lives made big differences to large numbers of people. The BBC World Service recently told the inspirational moving story of Oscar, a 12-year-old Bangladeshi boy. In his poverty-stricken area of Bangladesh, it's traditional for many girls to be married off 
in arranged marriages at 14 or 15 years of age. Even though the practice is illegal, the law is not enforced and the practice is widespread. The life chances for such girls are grossly affected. Oscar and some of his classmates thought that this was wrong. So they began an education campaign, walking from village to village to say what they thought to adults. They set up an information system to alert and embarrass the authorities into action whenever such an arranged marriage was about to happen. Oscar and his friends are making a difference where they are with what resources they have at their disposal. He and others are following a principle once outlined by Confucius, who said that he who works for the good of others has already secured his own. I sometimes conclude fundraising pitches for my party at home with a quote from a very famous British Prime Minister in the 19th century, William Ewart Gladstone, who was from my party and also from my home city of Liverpool. He offered this general advice, be happy with what you have and are. Be generous with both, and you won't have to hunt for happiness. I then conclude by simply asking people to be generous. Thank you very much.